So just to start things off, I want to tell you a little bit about what I do here. Um, again, my title is VP of Accounts. I'm basically in charge of managing the customer service department and the sales department. Um, but besides making sure our customers have the best experience with our software, we also really make it a priority to help them with the best practices for their business. For example, um, if we have any insights on online security strategies like what we're doing today, um, any organization uh, and marketing advice, we definitely um, help our customers improve their business and the efficiency of their firm. Um, so to start things off, I'm, I'm very excited to speak about this because I had the opportunity to speak about privacy and security um, in Orlando for the CFAWL a few months ago. Um, and I'm happy that I'm able to speak about it again and have you everyone have everyone listen in on to this webinar. Um, so what are we going to talk about? So today we're going to talk about privacy and security in the 21st century. Um, if you haven't noticed, technology is moving at a rapid pace faster than anything else. Um, and because of that, the growth of technology means there's more there's going to be more growth in cyber crime. Um, according to cybersecurityventures.com, cyber crime costs in 2015 were 400 to 500 billion dollars. That's with a B. And in 2016, the cyber crime went up to two to three trillion dollars. I can't imagine what's going to happen in the years to come. Um, all I know is, you know, it's good to have technology grow, and, and it's very important that we're aware of what we could do to prevent ourselves from getting hacked or anything like that. Um, so what I want to cover first is a group called Dark Code or, or a company called a website called Dark Code. Um, if you haven't heard of them, um, what they are, they're a sophisticated cyber criminal site. They were launched in 2007. Consider them like the Facebook for hackers. This is where all the hackers meet up um, after hours, basically, and uh, their intention is to buy and sell malware um, that's meant to steal information. Um, so all these hackers, these cyber criminals, uh, could steal anything from Facebook follower list to database account passwords. Um, I remember in, in 2015, the federal law enforcement actually took down the site. Um, it was down temporarily, but um, they eventually, the, the hackers themselves actually uh, created another site, brought it back up, and it's kind of living in the shadows. But it's still uh, operational today, um, and it's scary because this isn't the only one. There are, there are many others. Um, Another group that I, I want to mention is called Olaris. So it's actually a, a Russian cyber criminal. Olaris is his nickname. Um, he basically hired a group of hackers to hack into nearly 50 law firms back in 2006 or in 2006. Um, and the intention of all this was to hack into these law firms, launder money, and locate drafts of mergers acquisitions. Um, that's what they wanted to do. So, you know, again, technology is expanding, hacking, cyber criminals are growing. So who's at risk, right? That's that's the real question. Um, everyone, everyone is at risk. Me, you, everyone that you know is at risk, anybody using technology. Specifically, it's actually law firms. Um, and I hate to break it to you guys, but uh, law firms are actually being dubbed soft targets by these criminals. Um, and the reason why, and we'll get to it very soon, but there is a very true and interesting reason why they are calling law firms soft targets. Um, so even lawyers, paralegals, assistants, all types of law firms, you guys are the ones that they're looking after. So why? Why are they actually hacking law firms and lawyers? Um, basically, you guys have the good stuff. You guys have all the information that everybody wants. You have client information, case information, client social security numbers, their credit cards, um, any trade secrets or intellectual property. And that's what um, Olaris, the group, that's what they're after. They're after uh, intellectual property and, and trade secrets. Um, lawyers have all the personal information for their clients. Everything, anything you can think of, they have. Um, and the whole point of this is the main, the big intention here is is for money. Everyone's after money, and they're doing it in a legal way. Um, they're essentially doing it on the black market for, for cyber criminals. Um, what they'll do is they will actually hold your money, uh, hold your data ransom, and we call this ransomware. And I'm sure you've heard of many law firms that were victim to ransomware. I'm sure you know of somebody that was victim to ransomware. 
Um, so I just want to quickly cover what ransomware is, what it does, um, and like the next slides would be how you could prevent it. So ransomware is a type of software. It's obviously malicious. Um, it prevents you from actually accessing your data um, or your computer until a certain amount of money is paid. So let's just say, for example, you're on your computer, and I'm sure you know, raise your eyebrows if this is true, and if you've seen this before, um, you get an email from a colleague, a very close friend, a client even, um, and the email says, hey, you know, uh, I forgot to attach the contract, or whatever it was. And you're opening up the email, and you actually see, yeah, that's the client, that's my friend, or that's my colleague, and there is a PDF icon, and it definitely looks legitimate. What, what do you do? You just click on the, the document. You're like, yeah, why not? You download that document, that PDF document. What happens is once you download it, that's when it starts. It's like a, it's like a virus. It, it crawls the computer and encrypts all your files so they're actually inaccessible. So either it'll lock you out from your computer or it'll allow you to go into your documents, but every document that you go into, it infects. Um, so... Basically, these these hackers they they put up a ransom. You know, they they launch this this virus, this malicious ransomware. Um, they put up uh, an amount, a set amount that they want you to pay, and they put up um, a set time they want you to pay by. And if you don't pay it by a certain time, they will raise the price. Um, so many times, these hackers actually accept Bitcoin only as ransom. They don't accept credit card payments or wire transfers. It's just Bitcoin. Um, and if you don't know what Bitcoin is, it's a little different than a wire transfer. It's a little different than Venmoing or, or PayPal. It actually takes a couple of days to set up. And if you don't know how to set it up, um, you're going to have to find someone to set it up. So all this time that you're trying to figure out how to actually get Bitcoin up and running, time's ticking and you your, your, your ransom is due very soon. So what is the ABA uh, What is the ABA? actually say about this. So the ABA cybersecurity resolution, um, in a nutshell, it basically tells attorneys that they have an ethical and common law obligation to take whatever means necessary to protect their clients. I mean, anything that they think their clients would be a victim of, they have to let their clients know. Um, attorneys also must warn their clients about the risk of sending emails. Um, at the end of the day, anyone could really get hacked. Um, it's also a lawyer's duty to educate their clients. And what we do here at Practice Panther, for example, is besides actually, you know, demoing the software for attorneys and, 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 and you know, walking them through our software, we make sure to educate our clients on how to improve it on their business, how to secure their passwords, how to make sure that they're up and running with the least amount of risk. Um, that's what we do. So same goes for attorneys. It's your job to really educate your clients and make sure they're getting all the right information and they're being uh, warned. Um, so the good news is, on the bright side, that there is a way to prevent this. Um, yes, sure, we're all victims, and yes, sure, all lawyers are soft targets, whatever it is, but there is a way to prevent you guys from actually getting hacked. Um, we came up with actually a, a security checklist. Um, this was featured on a website, I think it was uh, lawyerist or um, above the law.com. Um, we've actually compiled a comprehensive security checklist of what you need to do and what are some things you could download and use um, to help your firm. So, the first thing I want to cover is LastPass. If you haven't heard of LastPass, um, pay attention because this application is awesome. We use it in, the, in our in our company here at Practice Panther. LastPass is basically a plugin for your browser for Google Chrome, and a plugin is uh, essentially an application for your web browser like Google Chrome. Um, it's cloud based. What it does is, once you download it, it creates it allows you to create a master password that only you know and that you could access all your websites without having to remember it. So it generates all the passwords for you if you wanted to, or you could create your own passwords, up to you. Um, it also allows you to securely store all your passwords for each site. And I'm sure you guys have your important sites, right? And then you also have your Netflix and your Amazons and your PayPal and, and your bank account information. All this information, you're better off using LastPass to save your passwords. Don't write it down on a piece of paper. That's very, very risky. Um, if you lose the paper, now you have to actually request a password change. It's, it's annoying. Um, LastPass is very convenient, and a lot of these, you know, we go to these trade shows, and the and and many of the topics that they talk about is uh, security, and 
every time we go to these trade shows, uh, a lot of the the speakers they always mention LastPass and they use it themselves. And attorneys, you know, when we speak to them on the phone, we recommend them LastPass. We use it here at Practice Panther, so it's awesome. Um, if you don't want to create passwords at all for yourself, it does it for you. All you need to do is remember one master password. So the question is, you know, what is a good password? That's a good password. If I can't read it to you, that means it's a good password. So four things that a good password should contain. Number one, it should have at least 12 random characters long. The more, the better. Um, I know it's complicated. I, don't, I know you don't want to even bother creating such a long password because now you have to remember it. But again, if you're using LastPass, you don't have to worry about it because it'll save it for you. So 12 random characters long. The second is it should include numbers, symbols, and uppercase. So dollar sign, hashtag, for example, um, an uppercase letter, like a, the capital A that's here, an exclamation point. Again, the more complicated it is, the more random it is, the better. Um, and you should actually be changing your passwords every six months. Um, it's very convenient to just keep a password forever. Um, and it's convenient. You go into your computer, you just log in, it saves it for you, and that's it. Change it every six months. If you change it every three to four months, even better. Um, again, I always want to mention this a lot. I'm sure a lot of you are like shaking your head saying, no, I don't want to remember a password to create one. LastPass can generate it for you. Um, what I like to do sometimes is I'll just close my eyes. And when a new website requires me to change my password, I'll close my eyes and I'll just start banging on the keyboard and whatever comes up, that's my password. Um, the problem is if they'd ask you to, if it asks me to repeat or retype the password, I'm, I'm in trouble. So what's a bad password? I'm sure of you. I'm sure a lot of you have an obvious answer. So I thought, you know what? Let's get some uh, entertaining examples here. So I went online and um, I remember I was watching Jimmy Kimmel, and he actually, or he had somebody in in his uh, in the show go on the street and interview people um, for a bad password. And, and here's what here's what it is. Let me play this for you. Let's go back. You know, we've been hearing a lot about cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened to Sony. Companies and individuals are more concerned about the safety and privacy of their information than ever. President Obama has unveiled a number of new proposals this week to crack down on hackers, and he plans to address this in the State of the Union speech on Tuesday. And it's great that the government is working on this, but the truth of the matter is we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, the most popular password in the United States is password123. And as long as we're, as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua with Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, uh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland one two three four. Gemma one two three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so what? like. Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. Oh, what's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password. Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the important thing is he, they learned a um, terrible... 
So obviously, um, ABC123 is, is the most popular password, and I'm sure a lot of you are smiling right now, especially while the video is playing, knowing that you guys probably had some similar passwords, like your pet's name or whatever it was. Um, true story, let's go back to the next slide. Um, there's a huge rave going on. It's been going on for a while, and it's it wasn't the elections, none of that. It was actually, uh, it's actually Pokemon Go. Everybody's using it. Everyone's playing with it. They're walking around with their heads down. Um, so recently, the Pokemon, the, the creator of Pokemon Go, his Twitter account was actually hacked. Can you guess in your head what password he had? The password was no pass. That was his password. When they hacked in, they found out his password was no pass. So if the creator of Pokemon Go had a password no pass, then imagine how many passwords or how many people are putting their passwords that are super, super simple. It's so important. I know it's such a hassle to create a long password and save it or generate and all this stuff, but long term, trust me, you do not want to get ransomware. You do not want to get hacked. You don't want to get any of your, can you imagine if your client's information was hacked? You do not want that. The next slide I want to talk about, um, I'm sure many of you know, is called two-step authentication. Um, you could do this with Google. I use it. I use it for my cell phone. I use it, I use it when I go on my Gmail account. Um, this is also known as two-factor authent authentication. Um, basically, what it does is it just adds an extra layer of security to your Gmail account. Um, so what it does is it uses two forms of identity, something you know and something you have. So something you know, what do you know? You know your password, right? And something you have is your cell phone, for example. So if I go onto Gmail right now, and let's just say I take my laptop with me, wherever it is, I log into Gmail and I have two-step authentication or two-factor authentication enabled, um, it, Gmail will require me to put in my password and then it'll send me a message saying, more, check your cell phone and you should receive a verification code Whatever that verification code is, please go back and put it into Gmail and then confirm it and then continue. Only then will, will it allow me to actually log into my, e my email account. Um, so that's two-step th two authentication. Um, it, you sign in with your password and a code will be actually sent to your phone to confirm. Um, great thing is Practice Panther, for example, we have it enabled in our software, so you could enable it. Um, if you're using Practice Panther, you could enable two-step authentication um, and it will require you to confirm. Also, something that you have could be, um, yeah, it'll be your cell phone as well. The next thing I want to talk about is Box. Um, very popular, very popular document management software. Um, Box, if, if you've heard of Dropbox, and it's very similar, uh, Box actually allows you, just like Dropbox, to access your files from anywhere on any device. They have a mobile app available. It's, it's really convenient. Um, it allows you to actually manage access levels. It has sharing policies inside and outside your firm. It's HIPAA compliant. And bear in mind, even if you don't really care about HIPAA compliancy, the fact that Box initially went out of their way to become HIPAA compliant means that they're very, very serious about security. Um, they also have 256-bit encryption for all the documents. Um, obviously, Practice Panther integrates with Box as well. You know, again, a lot of these trade shows that we go to, legal tech shows, two topics they always talk about, cloud versus server, and then they talk about um, file management. And every time they talk about file management, Box was always the topic of, of choice. So uh, a lot of attorneys, you know, use Google Drive, that's all great, but Box was something that these keynote speakers spoke about, and then attorneys came to us and asked us, hey guys, do you integrate with Box? And we did a little bit more due diligence and found out that attorneys really want something super secure, um, and they, we found out that they wanted Box. So we recommend this to attorneys. Obviously, if you have Dropbox, it's also very secure. Um, this was kind of like a choice that attorneys recommended to us. Um, secure Payment Processor, LawPay. I'm sure many of you use PayPal, Stripe, um, one of those. LawPay um, is very similar to that. It's specifically designed just for attorneys. Um, legal payment processing company, um, it was designed for attorneys just to use securely. Um, it basically helps. What's awesome about LawPay is it actually helps attorneys um, accept trust account payments, and it actually takes the fee from the operating account, which is huge. 
um, and it is actually the most trusted and recognized merchant processor approved by the ABA. Um, and it also has fraud and chargeback protection. A lot of our clients that come into Practice Panther, you know, we, we do integrate with Stripe and, and PayPal. They're all secure. Um, but LawPay, again, if it's specifically built for attorneys, you probably want to use something more tailored to you. Um, we're a big fan. If you're interested in them, send me an email. I'll leave my contact info at the end of the slide. Um, we have great contacts through, with LawPay and a great partnership, and we'll put you in touch with them. Uh -huh. All right, let's go to the next slide. Enabling six-digit passcodes for your smartphone. So I have an iPhone. Um, I know right now I have an iPhone 6. Before my iPhone 6, I had an iPhone 5, and it, the iOS um, wasn't updated. Um, so basically, if I wanted to create a password for my phone, it required me to put in a four-digit passcode, which is standard. Very, very, very standard. Um, I recommend if you don't have your, your iOS updated to update it, uh, because that way it'll allow you to actually add an extra layer of security instead of having four pass or four digits to actually enter in for a passcode it will require you to have six digits very very important those two extra digits will throw off a lot of people um, so again if you have an iphone with an ios 9 or later you could definitely enable a six digit passcode if you don't have it enabled and you want to have more security on your phone i definitely recommend it BitLocker encryption. So I'm sorry for Mac users. Um, actually, I believe there is some type of encryption for Mac, but um, this is more for Windows. Um, Microsoft created a program called BitLocker encryption. Um, again, all this, you'll see the common denominator is just to add an extra layer of pr protection for your computer. Um, what this does, BitLocker, it provides better data protection. It encrypts all of the data stored in your PC. Um, if anyone even steals your laptop or takes the hard drive, they can't actually access anything because it's encrypted. Um, it's available for Windows Vista and later. And I, before I go to the next slide, I just want to talk about encryption. Some of you may know what encryption means. Some of you may not know what encryption means. Um, encryption, what does it mean? I'm going to give you a quick kind of um, example of what it, what it means. Encryption basically takes whatever data, whatever words that you want, and meshes it up and puts a bunch of gibberish in it to make it non-readable by anyone else that could hack it. So for example, let's just say I want to send an email to my colleague and I want to make sure that that email is encrypted. What that means is when I type them a message and I attach something to it, I want to make sure that that document and the message is not readable. So encryption, what it does is it takes that message and a document, essentially just puts it in a blender, mixes it up, throws a bunch of raspberries and strawberries and whatever it is, and makes everything gibberish. The only way someone could actually read it is if they had a decryptor. So imagine all your files on your computer could be encrypted. That means if anyone hacked it, they wouldn't be able to see anything. Very huge, very important. Um, I know they have it for emails as well. This is for Microsoft um, for Windows, awesome. Next thing I want to talk about, one of my favorite, favorite things, and it's free, um, is Malwarebytes. Um, Malwarebytes, what it does, you can download it for free. Um, it cleans infections in your computer. It basically just detects and removes malware. So um, a lot of, I think a lot of people get confused on what malware is and, and virus and spyware and all this stuff. So think of malware as an umbrella. So it's a broad term used to describe different viruses and spyware and adware. So malware is just a broad term to an umbrella that under that umbrella includes viruses, spyware, adware. So malware bytes, you can download it for free. Um, I do believe they have it for Mac as well. It's for Windows. It's a free download. They have their premium versions, but the free, the free version would do fine. Um, you download it. It's really fast. And once in a while, you just clean up your computer. It'll, it'll scan everything and clean it up for you, and you could quarantine it. It's awesome. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a privacy screen on your laptop. I use this. I know my colleagues use this. I know plenty of attorneys use this when they go traveling. So raise your eyebrows again if you're one of those people that goes to Starbucks or goes to the airport, obviously to travel, and you sit in the terminal and you just don't want anyone to see your work and you're working on a case or whatever it is. Or you're just buying something uh, and you don't want anyone to see. Um, so a privacy screen on your laptop is really awesome. Um, it, base, it just prevents strangers from peeking over and looking at all your information, all your screen. Um, you could protect your sensitive data. 
Um, it allows you to only see directly into the screen. So what that means is if you've ever been <clears throat> on JetBlue flight, because that's one of the only airlines that actually have TVs, um, and you're sitting down. So imagine you're sitting down in front of your seat, you have your TV in front of you, you can see perfectly, right? The lighting is perfect, the, the words are perfect, it's clear, you know what you're seeing in front of you. But if somebody's sitting two seats behind you or to the side of you and they're peeking over to your screen, they're really not seeing anything that's actually tinted. Um, let me show you a picture here. <clears throat> perfect example. So if you notice, look at the far back computer laptop, you'll notice if you're looking directly in front of the computer with this privacy screen, you'll see crystal clear, all the information that you want. But go a little to the side and even more to the side, now you'll see it tinted, you won't be able to see anything. This is, um, they have this on Amazon, I'm sure you could get it on eBay. Amazon is my preferred uh, choice of places to purchase. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is encrypted VPN. So VPN, for those of you that don't know what it stands for, um, it stands for Virtual Private Network. Um, and if you're noticing the, the diagram on the top right, you'll see. So VPN, you don't have to actually ever surf the internet again, ever, on a public Wi-Fi. So if you go to a hotel, you go to Starbucks, what's the first thing that you do? You go to their free Wi-Fi and you connect to it. That free Wi-Fi is not private. It was not designated for you. It was designated for everyone that's there. It's completely public. So if you really, really want to protect your, your searching of the internet and surfing and all that, you want to get a VPN. Um, again, it encrypts your connection. Remember what we said about encryption. It takes whatever data that is being transferred and turns it into gibberish so no one can actually access it. Um, it provides anonymous IP to protect your to protect your privacy, and I'll mention what IP stands for in a in, a, in, the, ne in the next slide, um, and it's really cheap. Um, I found on PrivateInternetAccess.com, it's only six dollars ninety five cents a month. That's it. It's very cheap. I use it. I know my colleagues use it. Every attorney that I speak to, and every attorney that our colleagues speak to here, um, we always ask them, "Do you have a, a VPN? Are you working remotely all the time?" And many many of them say yes, and we always tell them, "Get yourself a VPN." and uh, Thank God a lot of them actually use a VPN, so it's awesome. And you'll notice, like the diagram is very, very simple, right? It dumbs it down for you. It, you're, you're on your laptop, you're connecting to the internet. If you have a VPN, it'll take your IP address, which we'll get to, and it'll completely encrypt it. And so, as promised, what's an IP address? Um, it stands for Internet Protocol. Um, in layman's terms, it's just basically the address of your computer. So you have an address to your house, you have an address to your office, you have an address to anything. Your computer also has an address. It's called an IP address. Um, so if you download, uh, if you purchase a VPN, it'll take your computer's public address and actually encrypt it. So no one will see it. And the IP address of a computer, it looks something like that. If you see in the quotations, 98.96, etc. etc. The next slide, encrypt client communications with the client portal. So I was mentioning before with ABA, um, they said that you know attorneys have to do whatever means necessary to protect their clients and make sure that their clients are actually informed by any potential breach of data, whatever it is. Um, the truth is, email is not super secure. You do not wanna use email. You actually wanna use something called a client portal. Um, with a client portal, it allows you to actually send confidential emails without having to do it through Gmail. Do not send confidential emails and messages to your client through regular email. Um, a client portal, basically what it does is it allow it creates a username and password for a client, your, all your clients, they log in securely, and once they log in, they could send and receive messages to you and you could send one messages to them. Um, the best part about a client portal, and, and that's something that Practice Panther has also, is that it's completely encrypted. Remember, encryption means all your data and everything is gibberish unless somebody has a decryptor. But with a client portal, it already is encrypted. It doesn't have to decrypt it. It just does it on the back end. You don't have to worry about it. Your clients don't have to worry about it. It's done for them. It's super convenient. So client portal, your clients can log in, super secure. You could send them messages. You could send them uh, uh, attachments, whatever it is. Um, I just want to give you a screenshot <clears throat> of uh, a client portal in Practice Panther. We have uh, two-way encrypted messaging. So an attorney sends a client a message, it's completely encrypted, the client receives it, also encrypted, um, and the client can do the same thing for the attorneys and send it back to them. Um, 
also with, with Practice Panthers Client Portal, for example, um, you could also send events, tasks, share it with a client. You could even share their invoices, their payments, and all this is encrypted. Um, and it's, it's really, really good and convenient for the clients. Self-destructing emails. So I'm sure many of you have watched the movie Mission Impossible. And there is, uh, I forgot how many seconds left to, uh, until the message self-destructs. Think about it like that, but self-destructing emails does all that, except it actually doesn't blow up. It just makes the message disappear. So if you don't want to use a client portal, there's always something available for people that don't want to use some, a different application. So within Gmail, there's an application or an extension called Snapmail. Um, really cool. Um, it basically allows you to write a message in your Gmail. And when you send it out, that message will actually self-destruct. And when I mean self-destruct, it'll just disappear after 60 seconds after the person read the email or opened the link. Um, so it includes and make sure it, that all the sensitive information never remains unprotected. Um, some people don't like it because they want to have a, a trail of their emails. But if you really don't care and you want it to be super, super secure, um, stamp mail is awesome. Um, the next slide that I was going to, I'm going to cover, I actually didn't plan on it, um, but I thought it was really cool. Um, I'm a big fan of Mark Cuban, and if you heard of him, um, I'm sure you know he's a billionaire, multi-billionaire, owns the Dallas Mavericks, and he's super into security. Um, so he actually invented an application called CyberDust. Um, very cool, you can download it for your phone. Um, it basically allows you to send private messages, they're all encrypted, to your recipients. Once the message is actually read, it disappears in 24 seconds. Super, super cool. Um, a lot of, uh, I read an article that a lot of divorce lawyers actually use this app to communicate with their clients. Um, you can download it. Um, it's called CyberDust. Really cool. The next thing I want to talk about is making your website domain private. Um, so when you buy your domain, let's say www.attorneylawfirm.com, whatever it is, um, all that information, if you go on GoDaddy, for example, and you log in, um, it requires you to put in all your information, right? Your phone number, your name, your address, etc. So <clears throat> all this information, the registrar's info, which is you, is available to the public on this website called whois.com. So if you go to whois.com and you type in a website, you will find if it's not if it's not private, you will find the person's phone number, their cell phone number, their address, their email, everything. So you could actually take your law firm's website and make it completely private, and it only costs ten dollars a year. So for ten dollars a year, no one will bother you, and you'll be completely protected and and have peace of mind. Um, again, you can set this up anywhere you buy your domain. For example, if you buy it on GoDaddy or Bluehost, whatever it is, um, it's all it's all available there. Really awesome. I use it. I have my website, and uh, it's really good. Cool. Here is an example, a side-by-side -side comparison of what's public versus private. So on the left-hand side, you have the public information on who is. Um, you'll see it's Jane Doe, 123 Main Street, phone number, email, etc. And on the right side, you'll see that it's private. Um, yeah, you'll notice that there's a phone number there and email, but typically, well, number one, that email is not a real email. And typically... Um, if you see the phone number there on a private domain, it's probably for the IT person. Um, again, $10 a year, really cool. Next slide. <clears throat> HTTPS versus HTTP. So HTTPS, if you're ever on, for example, uh, let's say you go on your bank, you'll notice on the top left corner of the website before the www that something says HTTPS, and you'll see it on the top right over here. It stands for Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Long story short, it just means it's more secure connection. So some of the most popular companies that offer online security badges are Norton, McAfee, Trustee, or even server provider like GoDaddy. You could get it and you could purchase there to make it an HTTPS instead of HTTP. So if your website, if you're on the website and it's missing a security badge, um, and it in the security badge, you'll see it's like a little lock. Um, ideally, you would want it to have a security badge. That's the best. Um, and the beauty about this, and if you're into marketing and SEO, um, HTTPS sites actually get ranked a little bit higher on Google for SEO, which is awesome. So 
it's a, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're getting a more secure website and you're getting a little higher ranking. Um, so definitely get that. It's really awesome. Again, you could go in on GoDaddy. You could do it on McAfee, Norton. One of those is fine. So another application or an, uh, an extension that I wanted to cover is WordFence. So I'm sure many of you have websites and you probably created it through WordPress.com. Um, so on WordPress, there is a plugin and a plugin is basically just an extension or an application actually for the website. And WordFence, what it does, it protects your WordPress site. Um, it's 100% free and I, I, they do have a premium version, but again, the free version is fine. All it does is it just blocks hackers from taking over the website. You want this. It's worth it. Trust me. The more security, the better. Again, these are the common denominator, how to increase security and how to prevent yourself from getting hacked. And this is one of the best ways to do it. Um, we use it at Practice Panther and it's awesome. Um, and here's an example. This is not our website. I just took this image. Um, and you'll notice here's the plugin and you can just install it over here. Really simple, very secure. Next slide. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was using a secure case management software. Some of you or many of you already use a secure case management software like Practice Panther, for example. Um, the best part about this is <clears throat> you don't have to work in so many applications. You don't have to work and purchase so many applications and log in so many passwords to remember. You could only you could work off of one program that does everything for you. So if you're using a case management software like Practice Panther, for example, what it does is it'll secure all of your client information. Complete everything's encrypted. Everything. It does it all for you. It stores it in one place. You don't have to worry about it. Um, it also will securely manage all your trust account correctly. Trust me, the headache that I hear attorneys tell me about managing their trust account and other client information, um, it's a pain in the butt. You definitely want to have some type of case management software to manage your firm. Um, and the best part, you work remotely. For example, we had a client. Um, he is located in New Orleans. He didn't have um, – he was – having all his clients information with paper files like a cabinet right um <clears throat> and they actually had a flood and he i remember all his office flooded you know what that meant all his client information flooded all the documents flooded the papers everything um had he had oh uh, thank god afterwards he actually used a case management software he signed up to us and even if that happened, if there was a natural disaster, all the information is completely backed up in real time, secure. You can work remotely. If it's if you have a snowstorm, you don't have to worry. Everything is remote, accessed remotely. If somebody calls in sick and they can't access their files, yes, they can. They can access it remotely. Everything is secure and encrypted. Very important, if you're using a case management software, this is something you should – Always, 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 always look out for. Um, this should be your your pre-qualification questions to ask um, your case management software company. Are they encrypted and what type of encryption do they have? So for example, what you wanna ask is, um, is there any two-way encrypted messaging? So for example, with Practice Panther, in the client portal, there is a two-way encrypted messaging from the attorney to the client and from the client to the attorney. Um, with Practice Panther, you also have 256-bit military-grade encryption. Um, what that means is it's the same security as online banking, right? So if you go into your online banks, it's super secure. I mean, banks have to have it super secure. So we ha made sure that we have the same protocol. Um, when you actually log in, all the data that's transmitted um, uses encrypted connections, all of it. Um, very important, make sure that this is one of the questions you ask for your case management company if you don't have one yet. And if you do have one, make sure to ask them regardless. This is another thing that we mentioned earlier, two-step authentication. Um, you have it for Gmail, for example. You also have it, I'm sure, for your Outlook. Um, make sure that the case management software company you use has a second layer of security, a two-step authentication. Remember, something you know, which is your password, and something you have. So. For example, on Practice Panther, you could log in, you enter your email and password as usual, like you would always, and then you just confirm it, you confirm the verification code via your phone or your email, for example. Um, really important, make sure they have it. Automated offsite backups. If you're going to a case management software company, you definitely, most definitely, wanna make sure that all your data is completely backed up every second in real time. If it's not, you're in big trouble. You need to find this out. Um, 
it, for example, in Practice Panther, obviously everything is backed up real time. You also have the ability to export your data into Excel as a CSV anytime you want. It's your data. Um, so make sure that whatever company you are using, software that you are using, you have this ability to do that. Very important, custom security settings. I know, for example, Box has this, but it's very important that the software company you're using also has security roles. Um, you want to be able, especially if you're the admin, to limit user access roles. Um, so this is just a screenshot from our software, Practice Panther. Um, you could limit which person sees what. So for example, in the picture here, I could allow this paralegal to create, view, activities, contacts, um, but I don't want them to actually edit anything. So very important that you should have this. Um, make sure that if you do have it, you use it. It's very important. Security roles are huge. Even if you're using a box or Dropbox, make sure you have some type of functionality to customize security roles. All right, guys, so the next slide we're going to talk about is um, updating your browsers. Very important slide um, because it happens very often you know, when we're online and we don't realize why there could be an issue or security flaw. So um, one of the things that I strongly recommend for people to do um, on a regular basis, and it's very, it's one of those things that you don't realize um, until somebody kind of lets you know about it. So updating your browsers uh, basically includes patching up any known security flaws, um, you know, to help protect against viruses or online threats. So for example, um, a lot of times, let's just say I use Chrome, right? Um, with Chrome, a lot of times the browser itself is not updated. Um, it works, it's functioning, but for security purposes, it needs to update on the back end. Um, so you could do this on Chrome by going to the settings page and updating it. Um, same applies for Safari. Um, if you have Mac, uh, Firefox, Opera, um, Edge, uh, all these other major br browsers, um, they have an option to update um, the browser, which definitely recommended. Um, if you don't know how to, you could always ask your IT person or you, know, you could email me at the end of the slide or at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. I'll go ahead and give you my email address. You could send me an email if you don't know how to do it. It's very easy. Um, I recently did it right before I did this webinar um, with my Chrome browser. Um, another thing I want to talk about is firewalls. Very, very, very important. Um, in a nutshell, this is, again, another layer of protection um, to keep your data safe. So firewalls, you, it basically allows you to block unauthorized access to your Wi-Fi network. So there are hackers out there that are just waiting to hack into your, into your computer, um, through your Wi-Fi, through the websites that you browse. Um, and the way to prevent it, along, uh, among the other ways you could do it from the list that I gave you, is by using a firewall. So if you have a Windows, for example, I have Windows. So with Windows, Windows has a Windows firewall. Um, which I could set up and activate. Um, so if you have an office, a computer office, or a personal computer, whatever it is, make sure that the firewall is enabled on all computers for all users. Um, it helps prevent basically your connection from being hacked. And you know we put a little diagram on the bottom, um, but it's again, it's just an extra layer of protection. So when you're going online on the internet and browsing whatever websites, it could be Facebook, Amazon, um, whatever it may be, um, as long as your firewall is enabled and it turned on, it will prevent hackers from actually getting on there. Um, it screens out them and it, it fil filters them out. Um, and essentially, what is a firewall? Uh, and I apologize, I didn't mention it before. A firewall is just, uh, it's, a so it's a computer program or a software program. Um, if you have like a Windows, I have a, I have a PC and Windows has it already installed. Um, I believe Mac also has one. Um, so definitely have your firewall enabled. Very, very important. Um, UAC. So don't disable UAC. What does UAC stand for? UAC stands for user account control. Um, do you ever notice sometimes you'll go on your bank's website or you'll run a program or whatever it may be and your computer automatically has this pop-up that asks you, hey, do you want to run this program? And your option is yes or no. Um, and sometimes your option is yes, but don't ever ask me this again. So that's what a UAC is. It's just like a, it's like a pop-up. Um, you'll see the diagram below or the picture below. Um, anytime you run a program or you have to download something or access the software, your computer will prompt you like a screen on, that they see right there below user account control and will ask you if you want to give access to that part of the software to your PC. Um, make sure that it's, it's always switched on the UAC. Otherwise, 
you could be going on a software or browsing somewhere and running a program and if the UAC is turned off, it will automatically allow it to run, which is a problem because if it's malicious, you've just automatically allowed a virus to just infect your computer. Um, and a lot of times Mac has this and Mac will actually ask you to put in your username and password. Obviously, Windows does it the same way. If you look on the bottom screen or on the bottom of the screen, um, you'll see the, the two screens. The screen on the right, it asks you yes or no. And then the screen on the left asks you, all right, if you want to continue, then you have to put in your username and password. Um, very important um, that your UAC is turned on and not turned off and make sure that everybody in the firm or in your business um, knows this. Typically, what I've seen is if you're not an admin on your comp on the computer, then you probably won't have the capability of allowing it to continue or not continue. Um, administrative users uh, are the ones that typically have um, the prompt to put in the username and password unless you actually have it. Um, but double check, double check in your firm that um, the UAC is turned on. Check on everybody's computer. And if you don't know how to, again, go to your IT person, ask them how to do it. It's very, very simple. Um, this is a simple slide that I wanted to add, but it's very important because so often, you know, we're sitting in Starbucks, we're standing in line at the DMV, whatever it may be. And, you know, we're looking through our emails and we're just trying to kill time and we'll look through emails. I'm like, hey, let me open up this email. So. My number one recommendation, if you have extra time on your hands, um, is to delete any unsolicited emails. Even if you don't have any extra time, spend at least, you know, I always recommend people to spend, you know, twice or maybe one or two times a day just going through their emails. During that time, spend some time deleting unsolicited emails. Um, the truth is you don't recognize every single email that comes through to you, um, especially if it's, if it's not a colleague of yours, if it's not a friend, but it looks legitimate you're probably going to click on it. So um, make sure to delete any emails that you weren't expecting and you could just cross-reference to make sure that the email is coming through is someone that you expected to send you an email. Um, I would do this at least once a week. You don't want to spend the whole day just deleting unsolicited emails because the truth is we get more spam emails than we do get legitimate emails. Um, for example, I use Gmail. So I, the email, like over time, um, Gmail recognizes what's spam and what's not. So I just send it to the spam folder. Once a week, I'll go to my Gmail account, I'll go to my spam folder, and I'll just quickly just skim it just to make sure that maybe an important email didn't go to spam. And then I'll just permanently permanently delete it. I mean, I'll mark it as spam. Um, the truth is, when an email comes in and you're not expecting it, that email could have a PDF file that may look legitimate. It could have a link to a video, whatever it may be. And it you click on it, and it ends up being super malicious. It takes you, downloads into your computer and just infects everything. Um, my father, for example, if he gets an email and it says, uh, you know, a great real estate deal, for example, he'll probably click on it. So you have to be very, very, very careful. And if you know anybody in your office or in your family or your friends that um, would be susceptible to clicking on something like that, um, then you got to warn them. A lot of times you'll probably get the response of, oh, I know what I'm doing. I know how to check my email. But it's very important because these hackers or these spammers, they really know how to create a really legit email that looks legit, that it's addressed to your name, to your father's name, to your mother's name, whatever it is, um, and will make you click on it. So do this once a week. Um, very important. If you have kids or young, younger generation that really, they don't pay attention, they just click on anything that looks shiny, make sure they delete it also. Very important. And mark it as spam as well. Um, use your folder password. So Windows and Mac users can actually apply passwords to their folders. So you know how you have a password and a username or whatever it is when you log into the computer or you go into you know, your software, whatever it is, um, you could actually create passwords when you open to apply to your folders. So this is awesome because it besides the the any encryption software that you have on the computer, you also have a password to get into a folder that could be very, very sensitive. So this adds obviously an extra layer of authentication um, to all your data. So these are the, the five quick steps. I'm just going to walk you through them. So, and on the next slide, I'll show you, there's a screenshot of how this looks. So you just select the folder or file that you want to essentially encrypt. Um, you would right click on it. Um, for you, for Mac users, I know some of you don't know how to right click on a Mac uh, mouse. Um, you just use both your fingers and click at the same time. Um, so you would right click on the file or folder. Then you would select properties. And on the general tab, just click the advanced button. And then what you're going to look for is encrypt contents to secure data. You're going to look for that option. 
And when you see that option, just check it off and then click apply and then click OK. Very, very, very simple five steps. I maybe say three easy steps, but you know, I'm trying to get more details for you um, to just add an extra layer of security to your files. And it, you really don't need a degree to do this. You don't need to be a software engineer to do this. You just need to be aware and be, you know, be concerned that th there could be hackers out there. So do these five steps right now when we get off the, the webinar. Um, any information that you think is super sensitive, definitely do this. Mac users and Windows users, definitely do this. And let me show you the screenshot. Um, this is how it looks like more or less. Um, the following object is about to be unlocked and then you could actually enter in a password to encrypt it. Really cool. I, I started doing it for a lot of my sensitive information. I, a lot of our clients started doing this as well. Um, very awesome to have this extra layer of security and just such an easy way to do it. Regular updates. Um, this is one that I think a lot of people don't regularly do. Um, so for Mac OS operating systems and Windows users, um, you guys both have to actually update your computer. A lot of times I'm on my, my Windows PC, I'll get a pop-up from my computer and it'll say you need to update your computer. Because sometimes when I need to update, it will require me to actually restart my computer, I postpone it. And I keep postponing it because I'm so busy. Um, so what I recommend is perform regular updates all the time. It just takes 10 minutes to update your computer in the morning. So if, if you're very busy and you're coming in the morning to the office, come in 10 minutes earlier so you could update this or stay in 10 minutes later so you could do this um, and just update your computer. Um, it'll protect your entire network from problems that Microsoft and Apple are already aware of. It's automatic. I mean, they give you a notification to update your computer. Um, so definitely do this. Uh, highly recommend. A lot of people don't do it. It's just not, it's, it's convenient to do it, but it's also convenient not to do it, um, which is, you know, kind of the double-edged sword here. Um, security for WordPress websites. So these are five security tips if you have a WordPress website. Um, and I'll walk you right through it. Um, the first one is run the latest version. So if, you're, if your website is built on WordPress, um, you want to make sure that you're actually running the latest version on your site. Um, otherwise, it's going to be glitchy. It's going to be susceptible to hackers. You want it to really run smoothly, especially when you know your potential clients or leads or whatever it is are actually on your website. You, you don't want them to experience any glitchiness. It just doesn't look good, and it, it's just not, it's not the greatest thing. Um, so that's number one, run latest version. Second thing, very important, installing plugins. You want to make sure, very important again, you want to make sure that your plugins are compatible with a version of WordPress, of your version of WordPress. Otherwise, you're going to be installing a plugin that's not compatible with your version of the WordPress, and it's going to be a problem. You're just going to run into a lot of glitches. It could be, again, always common denominator, susceptible to hackers. Um, the best way to do this, I recommend my, my clients, is search for search user reviews. There's plenty of them. And if there aren't any, I would recommend maybe avoiding that plugin. If you don't, very important, if you see a plugin that there are no user reviews on, it should be somewhat of a, of a flag. Um, find out also, very, very, very important, find out if the developers even offer support for that plugin if you run into any you know, glitches. Um, if they don't, it's a problem because then what are you going to do? You have a plugin that you're relying on and your website is relying on, but if you're running into any issues, who's going to who's going to fix that for you? So make sure that um, number one, when doing when installing plugins, it's compatible with your version of of WordPress. Number two, you want to make sure that there are user reviews and review them really really well. Um, and number three, find out if the developers for that plugin actually offer support if you run into any problems. Um, third, third tip, uh, deactivate and delete old plugins. So it's a security risk if you have old or the plugins that aren't like running properly, if it's outdated, um, turn them off, delete them, um, to keep them from, you know, keeping your site susceptible to any malicious malware software, whatever it is. Um, the, be the best part, I guess the cherry on top would be that it actually frees up any space um, so that means your computer will run faster. So FYI, if you're, if you have more space for, on your WordPress, your, your website will run faster. Um, number four, keep spam away. So a lot of comments on your blogs or whatever it is actually include our spam. A lot of times are spam. So you actually have the option to either, um, 
not automatically have comments appear on the blog and you could just review them and then make them public. Um, and then sometimes it's automatic, but I would recommend making sure that the comments are not enabled automatically. Um, so you could privately review them and then make them, you know, make them public. Um, so a lot of spam that are commented on your website or your blog, or whatever it is, actually include malicious software. They'll put a link. Um, and even if you're aware of it, that it could be fake, your potential client or lead or whatever it is can go onto the blog, read it, be really involved in the blog and somebody's smart and puts up a, a, a spam comment with a link according to the blog, whatever it is, and someone not paying attention could click on it and you just they've just been infected. Um, and they're not going to blame the spam guy, they're going to blame you. So it's important. You don't want your clients to run into any issues and you don't want to run into any issues. Um, we recommend two different anti-spam plugins. Um, there is AK, a -K -I -S -M -E -T, and then there is anti-spam B. So I have here, I'm going to leave this screen available for you guys to just write it down. Um, again, you'll have a copy of this webinar. Um, very important spam comments. I hate them. Um, nobody likes them. So make sure to go through those. Number five, deactivate old users. If you have any users in log as login and user and information on your website, former employees, developers, freelancers, whatever it is, either deactivate it or delete it if they're not still working with you. Otherwise, it's obviously not secure. You don't want it to be there. So if you have a freelancer that you worked with and they've done their job, that's it. Remove their, their uh, user information, deactivate it or delete it. Um, especially as former employees, even if you trust them. It's just a security precaution. You don't want to run into any issues. Make a security policy. I can't tell you how many times a lot of law firms, businesses, they don't do this. They just verbally say it. Um, they have a policy. Well, it's kind of a verbal policy. They'll tell people, hey, don't download this or don't click on this. But there's no actual policy that people could refer back to. Um, very important because what happens when you're so busy you're experiencing growth or whatever it is, and you're hiring new employees and you don't have the time to go and sit with them and review every security policy. And how do you know which security policies are even relevant anymore? So before anything, create a security policy. It's a like a document and create a folder for it and type and read, name the folder security policy. And before onboarding any new employees, make sure you actually share this security policy. Um, and what you should include besides you know like passwords and security protocols is applications and plugins that actually need to be installed when they get when they're hired so they could go into the computer who has access to secure information and any other security information that you think would affect the law firm um you know if you have very limited knowledge of security matters i recommend you know don't I'm very into like do it yourself, but if you really don't know, then hire a cybersecurity consultant or an IT person. I'm sure you have in, in, the, in the office um, that could write security policies for you. So you don't have to deal with that time. You're in the process of running a business. You don't want to have to deal with anything else. So make sure to go through that. Um, very important. I want to mention that when you do the security policy, don't just create it and let it be you know you want to you want to send an email to everybody in the firm even the new employees every time you hire a new employee you want to make sure that that new employee along with everybody else in the law firm and your business and your office gets a copy of this so introduce you know new john comes into the new office he comes in send an email to john hey john thanks you know for coming joining our firm whatever it is please refer to the security policy fyi everyone please see the security policy that's been updated number one send an email with security policy. And number two, I would recommend maybe once a month, once a week, whatever is comfortable, comfortable for you to have a meeting with your entire company and educate them on the new updates on security policy. Because if you're the only one that's really knowledgeable in this and nobody else is, you can't blame them for, for clicking the wrong thing or for not knowing. So have, have it a, a, a a, have it a policy in the office to have a security policy and make sure you send out emails with updates to security policies. Make sure you have company meetings about it. Um, what I would do, is, I, I've seen some companies do is they have um, kind of like a test. You know, they have like secret choppers or they have uh, people walking into a retail store pretending to be clients or customers to see how, you know, the employees react. Do the same thing with your employees, with your staff members. Make sure, you know, what you could do is you could test it out. You could send out an email that looks legit or whatever it is and see if they fail. And if they do, you could use that as kind of like a project to educate everybody else. 
we do have some questions, actually a list of questions. First question, great question from Jean. Um, how do I know if my firm is currently not safe? Typically, what you want to do is, the first thing I would recommend is you'd want to check your computers, right? So if you have a laptop, computers everywhere, you want to download Malwarebytes, um, and you definitely want to do a cleanup. Um, I recommend hiring an uh, antivirus or computer technician to do it for you. It's totally worth it, trust me. Um, I'm sure if you just Google it in your location, you'll find it. Um, but for yourself, if you have a pri even a personal laptop, <clears throat> you want to make sure you download Malwarebytes. Again, it's free. Um, clean it up um, and the truth is follow these 15 15 steps that I mentioned here I think it's a little bit more than 15 um, follow all these security tips this checklist um, it'll all these slides that I went through each slide is an extra layer of security so imagine if you had all these slides as an extra layer of security imagine how more protected you'd be um, question from Dominique what is safer, server-based software or cloud-based? Great question, Dominique. <clears throat> so both are very safe. Server-based is very safe. Cloud-based is very safe. Um, in my opinion, because something is cloud-based, because it's online, so to speak, um, it needs to be more secure. So when, for example, I have Chase, right? I go on Chase.com all the time. I transfer money. I add money, whatever it is. Um, do you think Chase is going to take the risk of having people access their information online and transfer money to do all that? Um, they have to take more precaution to make sure it's secure. So if it's online, it has to be more secure. Not all the time, but that's why you want to make sure there's you know two-step authentication. You want to have um, a long twelve minimum twelve character password. Um, but cloud-based and server-based, they're both very very safe. Um, just cloud-based, you can work. It's easier to work remotely. You have, like, for example, with Practice Panther, you have a mobile app, and it's also secure. It's pretty awesome. Um, another question from George: um, How does LastPass work? So, <clears throat> LastPass again, it's a plugin. It's an extension for your Chrome browser. LastPass, very, very easy. Um, you go on Google, you just type in LastPass extension, you download it. It's free. Um, and it'll prompt you through the windows to just create your username and password um, and you have the option you could um, You have the option to generate a master password and all you need to do is remember that password um, For example, if I go on to amazon.com right now and I have LastPass turned on or enabled um, When I log into Amazon a little green toolbar essentially will or Yeah toolbar will uh, show up on the top of the screen and it'll ask me do you want to save this password for this website? And obviously my option is yes or no. Um, so LastPass will allow you to save all the passwords. Um, and you can also delete passwords. Next question, let's see. How do I set up Malwarebytes? Question from Jackie. Um, setting up Malwarebytes is very easy. Um, again, just go to Google, type in the search bar, Malwarebytes download or Malwarebytes free download. Um, if you have a Mac, you type in Malwarebytes free download for Mac. If you have a Windows, Malwarebytes free download for Windows. It's very easy. It downloads it. Um, you'll have a pop-up to allow it to run it. Um, just save it. Make sure it runs. And then once it's actually downloaded, it'll appear on your desktop. And all you need to do is just run a scan. Super. You can do a full scan. That's what I prefer. Um, that's what I also recommend. Um, and same goes for, it's a, I guess, two-fold question. How do I set up a VPN? Um, <clears throat> VPN, you can type in, I had it in the other slide and everyone will have a copy of this uh, uh, presentation. Um, there is a website, uh, I think privateinternetaccess.com, I have to find it um, on the previous slide, but um, you go on, you type in VPN on Google, uh, uh, VPN, it'll give you a list of the top VPNs uh, to download um, or to purchase. Are Macs safer than a PC? Oh, I love this question. Uh, this is from oh, Jeffrey. All right, so question is, <clears throat> are Macs safer than a PC? Very interesting question, and you'll be surprised to hear the answer. So the truth is, I want you to think for a second, how many people have Macs versus how many people have PCs? Um, and it may seem like everybody has Macs, but the truth is, um, more people have PCs than they do have Macs. So if, you're, if I'm a hacker, right, if you're a hacker, and you're trying to hack into people, and you're looking at the numbers, right? Hackers are smart. They're geniuses. They're looking at pure numbers and logic. And they're looking at their odds. 
do they have better odds to hack into people that or more people that use uh, Windows or Macs? So if Macs, there, there's actually a less amount of Mac users than PC. So in the eyes of hackers, it's only worth it for them to hack into a PC. So it's not to say that Macs are more secure. It's just hackers don't really care as much. Um, so very, very, I've heard this question before. It's one of my favorite questions because um, it's interesting. Yeah, more people have PCs and it's just, there's more room to hack into. Um, let's see, we have some more questions. What is the difference between LaPay and PayPal? <clears throat> um, the difference is they both essentially do the same thing, but PayPal was designed for everyone. LawPay was designed and built just for lawyers, just for attorneys. You won't see a person managing a plumbing company uh, downloading LawPay. They just wouldn't because, number one, it's not approved by, I mean, LawPay is approved by the ABA. Um, also, LawPay allows you to manage your trust accounts better. Um, so it's specifically designed for attorneys. Um, you may ask yourself, oh, if I have PayPal, should I switch over to LawPay? Not necessarily. You don't have to. But if you want something, again, more secure, more designated for attorneys, I recommend that I'm always a fan of tailoring um, uh, applications for your type of business, especially for an attorney. Um, is box.com safe for my law practice? Uh, the question is, I'll repeat it again. Is box.com safe for my law practice? Definitely. Um, box.com is super safe. Um, they have different plans. I know they have a free plan. I think on some of their plans, it's uh, more HIPAA compliant. Uh, they have HIPAA compliance on one of their plans. Um, and they also have encryption, 256 encryption, uh, like Practice Panther. Um, let's see. Oh, I wanted to mention before. I know I, I talked about the six-digit passcode for iPhone. If you have an Android, you're in luck. Um, I personally don't like Android. Um, I do think they have awesome functionality. But what's awesome about Android is if you have a security enabler uh, to log into your, your phone for Android, um, it doesn't actually require numbers. I don't think it requires a pattern. Much harder to figure out, uh, much easier to change. Um, so I know Android has patterns that they, you could create and you just follow the patterns to actually log into your phone. Um, let's see, do I have any other questions? Uh, what does it mean that my messages are encrypted? <clears throat> Great question. Um, we covered this in the previous slide. Again, encryption basically just means that it takes your message and puts it into a blender and turns it into gibberish. So if I wanted to say, hi, how are you? And I wanted that message encrypted, what I'm really saying is I want that message, if hacked, to be read, blah, blah, blue, W321456. That's what encryption means. Um, so encryption just makes your message gibberish. Um, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, do I have to have a WordPress site to use WordFence? Um, I think WordFence is just for WordPress, so I'm pretty sure on that one. Um, again, it's free, so you can download it. They do have premium versions, but a lot of these free versions of downloads are are good enough. Um, let's see if you have any other questions. Um, I think that's it. I think we're all out of questions. All right, guys. Um, by the way, if you have any questions at all, anything that I covered here that you weren't sure of, anything that I didn't cover, if you have any questions about your firm, security, whatever it is, uh, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, there's my contact info. Again, my first name is Moore, last name is Um That's my direct line, 305-856-8729. My email is more at practicepanther.com. You could also get this checklist at www.practicepanther.com forward slash ultimate security checklist. And you could also go to, if you want to see more information about Practice Panther security, go to www.practicepanther.com forward slash security. All right, guys. Thanks so much.